here we are on the Creative People Show again, and I have a, a good friend of mine, Deborah Watson, who is a writer, producer, director, and uh, lots of different things going on in her life. She's got a lot of different things, a lot of irons in the fire like I do. And so uh, we want to just welcome her to the show, and she can talk about whatever she wants. And I've got a few things to, to ask her about, but... Thanks. Thanks for coming, Deb. No, wait a minute. You're giving a creative woman opportunity to talk about whatever she <laughs> yeah. wants. Well, yeah. <laughs> that can be dangerous. I know you That's can. That's like having two extra queens on the table. There. <laughs> <laughs> she was asking about why there's two two extra queens on the table. Any any chess p players know this that if you move one of your pieces all the way to the other side and you still have a queen, you get to replace it, and so you can have two queens at one time. Anyway. That could be a hot mess. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I'm really excited to, to see what, what we get to talk about, what is rolling around in us creatively yeah. for this time and this space. So. Yeah. Well, I, I know we first met in 2015, I think it was. Yeah. On, uh, when we first started, or I first started, you had already been filming or pre-production for the film Taney Como. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my first lead role in a film, and uh, it was about a, a homeless veteran with PTSD raising a teenage son, and so that was a very uh, uh, poignant uh, movie, and I, I really loved being a part of that. <laughs> I think people sometimes forget that there are homeless fathers with children because there's so much focus on, you know, mothers with children that yeah. are fleeing violence or whatever. But there's dads that are out there trying to make it work just as much as there are moms. And um, it was, that was a very interesting journey all the way around, you know, 24flicks.com. Yeah. They can see it. And you and Debbie Sutcliffe have actually been in films before together. Yeah, yeah. But that was the first time you were on set together. First time we were in the same scene together. Yeah, we had been in like four films uh, at, at different times, you know, filmed at different times, but not in the same scene. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of neat things that happen behind the scenes and yet yeah. in front of the camera as well to create the magic that's there. I've been amazed since I've moved to southwest Missouri how much and i guess it's grown since i got here in 93 but uh since i first started actively working in uh film and uh and theater and so forth i've i've noticed how much the 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 scene or the industry is around here but it's kind of a small group too you know you see some of the same people on each set every once in a while but I like to go on a set and meet all new people, and I think, well, that's great because I'm expanding my my uh, field of, of friendship. Yeah. Yeah. And there's Dukon Williams is in town now. Well, yes. similar. And then um, Gayla Pruitt with Floodwater Productions. She used to be a television talk sh or not talk show, but a journalist. And sh then she raised her children. Now they're all grown up, and she's getting back into the industry. So. I think people are going to be surprised how much creativity in the film industry is going to be coming out of Southwest Missouri in the mm -hmm. near future because yeah. it's already happening, yeah. but it was just that everybody was leaving the region for jobs, but they live here, and now they're starting to see the value of staying here and mm -hmm. working together here and then taking their their products that they create here. Yeah out to the nation so there's there's a lot of independent films and uh short films uh, feature films i got one 
in the works right now. I haven't filmed my, my scene yet, but uh, uh, Thomas Turbyville is, is another director and writer and producer in this area. Little Indian pictures. Huh. Anyway, I want to I want to mention some of uh, Deborah's Deborah's uh, accomplishments and things that she's involved in. Uh, first of all, she's the curator for the Branson International Film Festival. You just finished your fourth year. Fourth year. Fourth yeah. year. Wow. Yeah. Time flies. Uh, how did that go? I. You know, you're going to make me cry now oh, because there was such beautiful. There were so many beautiful things that happened. Like. Our goal is to help filmmakers in story, funding, production, and distribution. And um, Amy McCorkle from Kentucky came with two of her producers from L.A. and met there and hooked up with Joshua Carpenter from Green Apple Entertainment, mm -hmm. signed a distribution deal for her letters to Daniel, and also um, collaborated on a full feature that I can't tell a lot about, but she said, hey, can you come on board as one of our producers because we want to film there in Branson where all the magic happened. Yeah. So that was really cool to watch wow. that kind of transpire. So the vision of the networking and bringing people together um, for something greater than just that one small part that we play is beautiful to watch. And believe it or not, the Branson International Film Festival, that's not just a name because they have films and people come uh, people submit their films from all over the world. Yeah. And what, how many countries have 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 you got? Oh my goodness! Films so from now? I feel comfortable saying thirty-eight. Yeah. Um, Chris Marigudagi is from Athens, Greece. There were yeah. five people that came that first year. Mm -hmm. He actually created the opening um, video with Evan McGregor, who is here in Springfield. Yeah. Um, and this year we partnered up with Paul in Nigeria, uh -huh. who trains people there, and they did a one-week training, and then they ended it with some of our films and um, invited me to come to their um, graduation that they do yeah. and just pray a blessing over their students. And then um, nice. there is Choper Kabambi with Heart of Africa 1 and 2 out of the Congo. And then um, Nadam is in Cameroon. Uh -huh. And he's um, in two weeks doing their um, film festival that's birthed off of ours. So for next year, we're working with a platform where we can live stream ours, and then each country will have their own channel. So if somebody's like, hey, I wonder what kind of films are coming out of Japan, they can go to that specific channel and watch and see what's happening. So, wow. yeah, nice. some cool things happening. I, I noticed you, you got those names off without a hitch. You've practiced them, I, I can tell. <laughs> well, so there's a standing joke, too, with Chris <laughs> Marigudagis, uh -huh. because I'm going to make him a T-shirt because it's, it's he had to help me practice it. Yeah. So it's Merry Good Doggies. So we're going to have a t-shirt with a bunch of happy dogs on it. So that's, that's how funny. I can remember. Yeah, that's a good way to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. you got to make some kind of mnemonic uh, That creative device. mind, yeah. for me anyway. Yeah. Also, she is the executive director for Studio 222 Film Productions. I already mentioned uh, Taney Como that was finished in 2015, 2016. Uh -huh. And, uh, but... They're working on another film, is a feature film yes. this time, feature length film, uh, and it's called Not Too Far From Here, and I'll let you talk more about that. Lindsay was safe with her horse, nobody, at Papa George's ranch. She could depend on him no matter what. Then Jackson came to the ranch and admitted betraying her trust. In that moment, Lindsay knew she had to let hope carry her instead. Hi, I'm Kevin Sorbo, director of Not Too Far From Here. As a father of a teenage daughter and two teenage sons, I know how tough relationships are on kids today. They deal with adult issues at a much younger age, and yet, even in the midst of it all, there is still hope not too far from here, no matter where your here is. Will you help us spread the desperately needed message of hope our next generation needs? Reach us at studio222films.com. That's studio222films.com. Thank you for listening. Oh, sure. So not too far from here is a story where the curse of addiction collides with the courage of love. And really, it's a look at domestic violence through the eyes of teenagers. Um, it's something that is plaguing our nation. We've seen it manifest itself in the violence through the Black Lives Matter group, like they need their voice to be heard. 
But talking about it like you and I are talking right now isn't creating change. Mm -hmm. So they needed to do something more drastic. And instead of doing that, we're looking at it from the eyes of the kids that are being raised or growing up in it and how it affects them and their friends and their community. Mm -hmm. And so um, really excited about it because it's all about moving from hurt to hope. And usually when people hear domestic violence, they like freeze up if they've been a victim of it because that's a natural coping skill. And so when you have your fear-based emotion and your love-based emotion happening at the same time, you know, it's not like way over here and way over here. When they're happening at the exact same time, they're literally colliding with one another. And so you can be afraid of your spouse or you can love your spouse. And that's where courage comes into play Mm -hmm. when you learn to either accept the fact that you love them enough to let them go and walk away because as people, individual people, it's not a healthy environment and you need to be in a healthy environment. But if you hold on so tight, you could literally squash the life out of one another. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes love says let go. And yeah. that's not easy for me as a Christian being raised. Oops, sorry, totally. Sorry, guys, I hit my mic. <laughs> but <laughs> um, in in a Christian community, it's all about loving one another till death do us part. And sadly, we've known five people that it has been till death do us part. Mm-hmm. And two of them were children. And I couldn't silently sit by and watch it happen any longer, even though I've not been raised in a violent home, nor do I live in one. I mean, Mike and I have our arguments, but everybody does. It's not, you know, that's not abuse. That's not violence. You know, it's just, that's a whole nother world that until you've lived it and walked in it, um, it can be pretty scary, you know? And so we hit it from an angle of truth that's kind of hard to swallow. Um, but I think it's necessary to tell it this way because the truth will always set people free. Mm-hmm. So that's what gets me excited about it. And to have Hercules come along to direct it, I mean, yes. hello, why not? I didn't say that yet. Oh. Uh, Hercules is... Yes. Who? Kevin Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo. All grown up now. Yeah. You know, and he's directed, I believe, four films now. And he's still active, working around his schedule and funding and all of those aspects. Yeah. It's been challenging because we were hoping to film last year, but COVID hit. Yeah. And so now we've had to readjust some things, um, but it's so going to be worth it because in the process of doing that, we've been able to do the outreach aspect to people. Um, and we've got a thing we're doing right now where we partnered with Shane Grammer um, out of Los Angeles. He is a phenomenal artist. And this picture here is um, an example of one of his arts uh, paintings that he's done. Mm-hmm. And he uses spray paint, so he's a graffiti artist. Um, he's well known for, the after the Paradise, Paradise Fires, he went in and did some um, painting over the ruins because he wanted to have hope in the midst of it. He painted this one, and it's called um, Beauty in the Midst of Chaos. And so what we did is we put it on our wristbands, mm-hmm. and we're in the process right now of raising funds to get a million of these into the hands of police officers, first responders, um, shelters, domestic violent shelters, um, doctor's offices, mm-hmm. where people... And what's on the wristband? Sure. It says not too far from here, mm-hmm. and then it says love is... And then the number 22522, and that's the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Okay. So that so way, a, um, let's say you're a police a officer. Yeah. And you go, and you've been to that house yeah. a million times, and you keep getting called back. You can say, look, I want you to have this. Mm-hmm. And on there, if you can't call us, just text message love is to the number 22522, and it's going to hook that's you up. That's awesome. A text. Yep. And so why the picture? Um there's a beauty in her eyes, mm-hmm. but yet she looks torn. Yeah. Sadness. And we want businesses that want to be a safe space to partner with us and put this in their window of their business. So mm-hmm. let's say let's say I was I was the victim and I'm walking down contemplating things, walking down the sidewalk, 
And I'm like, you know what? I just can't stay here anymore. And I look up and I see that picture in a business window. I know I can go into that business and say, I just saw the picture. I need help. That's all they have to say. And the people working there will know right away. I call 911, have the police come in, help get them to a safe space, Mm -hmm. and let them take over. So it's like filling that gap of the decision making process because she could he or she could change their mind literally within seconds yeah so we want to be able to be there in that moment of them making a decision and let them yeah. know there is beauty in the midst of i think it. that's a really good idea about the text because sometimes a phone call is harder to make than yeah. a text a text can be done really quietly so what can you tell me about the t-shirt this is probably one of my favorite parts of our film project Um, on social media, I've been connecting with people that have lived through domestic violence, um, and learning from them. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's one, her name is Georgiana and she is by herself now raising two special needs teenagers. And she designed one of our t-shirts stronger together. And so for every t-shirt we sell, um, we give her a certain percentage of that as our designer. Nice. And this is another one because he is a he's a, a grown up now, um, but he was raised in a violent home. And I said, Scott, I need a shirt for the boys. <laughs> and I said, you guys are so key in carrying hope into the nations. Yeah. And he knows that eagles, when a storm comes, they fly above. They fly straight into the heart or the eye of the storm and rise above it. Mm-hmm. They don't hide from the storm. And so he designed this t-shirt and we just got it last week. Oh, um, okay. So it's one of our newer ones and I nice. want to give this to you as oh, a gift. Thank you. So that way um, you can remember to um, keep praying for those guys out there and carry the hope. And hope is, I think you've kind of adopted hashtag hope as your hashtag campaign yeah. for uh, domestic violence. Uh, yeah, I'm a Verizon phone user, and uh-huh. they used to have a program where any Verizon phone user could um, just do hashtag hope, and um, when they text it, it would put them straight into um, an outreach, and I believe they wow. still have it, oh, Okay, cool. but it goes to the Hope Line, which is yeah. their own in-house support system. I was thinking about social media, but I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so they took it to a whole nother level. Yeah. So, yeah. And nice. Mobile, Alabama, they actually, um, I got to speak with their chief of police there, very connected with Penelope's house, which is one of their shelters. Mm-hmm. And the Penelope's house has a 24-7 outreach so they can help take care of one another within the community. Now, why did I pick the National Domestic Violence Hotline instead of the inside community? Um, and it all hinges on Vashti's story. Um, on and what? Vashti's story. Oh, Vashti um, is a sister of a very de- dear friend of mine, Kathleen. And Vashti was leaving a violent home. Um, well, I don't want to say violent. It was more, um, there were mind games being played. And he, if you um, Google search the Brett Seacat case out of Wichita, Kansas, hmm. he was a Kansas Bureau investigator officer. And um, he basically manipulated her in ways, I guess that's not fair to say because I wasn't there, but as it's all played out, yeah. um, when he murdered her because she was divorcing him, she did everything the right way, you know? And um, he was there that one last night. Um, he convinced her to please let me come home, say goodbye to the boys, and uh, pack some stuff up and I'll be gone tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And he claims that she um, committed suicide by burning down the house. Yet when they found her, she had shot herself in the head. Mm. And where the gun fell wasn't where it would normally fall. And you can't shoot yourself in the head and then set yourself on fire. No. It just doesn't work <laughs> that way. So um, in her case, he he was the police officer. Mm. He was he was the person you call 911 and, yeah. and yeah. he would come. And so... That showed me that not all communities have safe spaces. Right, exactly. And I don't know everybody's story, mm-hmm. on, and I don't know if I could handle everybody's story, yeah. um, but I understand and I'm acutely aware that, okay, great, Mobile, Alabama is strong, and they're really, I mean, they're very supportive of our outreach as well. Mm-hmm. That shows that their city is very committed 
to bringing an end to violence. Let's change the subject a little bit. Uh, it's not quite uh, 180 degrees, but uh, Impact 22 is a group that you started, uh, an organization you started, and you, uh, your husband, Michael, is taking the reins of that one right now because you got so many other things going on. She is busier than a one arm or paper hanger, whatever that is. Uh, <laughs> I'm not bored. Uh, no, no. Uh, when I said I was going to start this this uh, this talk show, my wife said, "Like you don't have enough things going on, you know." <laughs> anyway, um, Impact Twenty Two. I I relate directly to this uh, because uh, I'm a veteran myself, and I know veterans who have struggled with PTSD. I myself have not, but um, I was fortunate enough to be in the military for 16 years and never be involved in combat. But um, Impact 22 is about that 22. The number 22 is significant. You want to expound on that? Sure. So um, statistically, they estimate that 22 veterans a day commit suicide because of PTSD and trauma from what they've seen. And um, when we started the film production company, um, one of the things that I looked at, there were some issues that I wanted to deal with in a healthy way. And um, we, had, we have guardianship of our great niece because her mom passed away when she was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And she said, when you start the film company, please don't tell my story because that's my story. And I promised her I wouldn't. But I looked at her life and her mom, who is our niece, and um, learned about PTSD and how her mom had been suffering from it from childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. But we just didn't know because we didn't have anything to call yeah, it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be from combat experience. Right. I looked at that and started learning about PTSD and what is it really. Because people can go through trauma and not have PTSD. Um, PTSD is something that goes beyond um, the trauma itself. It's when you don't cope with it within the first three months, that's when your mentality or your mental clarity can be affected and cause you to make different decisions in life, mm -hmm. which is what happened to our niece. Um, she became locked and frozen in that space. And so um, I learned about the 22 veterans a day and comparison to the 2.5 million veterans, I thought, you know, that's, that's really not that bad. But then my husband, who is a veteran, walked through the living room, and I was like, but what if he was one of them? Yeah. He's not, but what if he was? And that one suddenly became very important to me. And so I wanted them to know that they mattered, you know, that we see you, we hear you, we understand you. We can't help you to the magnitude that trained professionals can. Right, but we but we can connect direct you, with them. you to them. Yes. Yeah, because there's that stigma, and there's 22 different traumas that can create mm -hmm. PTSD. And first responders, um, your police yes. officers, your firefighters, they're the ones that see humanity at its ugliest. They can't come out to their commanding officers and say, "Hey, I'm having an issue with this," because they could end up losing their career. Yeah. You know, and as a police officer, if somebody says, hey, you're off the beat now, you have to take a desk job, they'd rather die than do that. I mean, literally. Yes. And unfortunately, that's what happened. But the neat thing is there are, what I've been learning from Jeff Lofton, who's a chief of police, mm -hmm. is there's a lot of change happening now yeah. that they are getting the help and the counseling when they do go to those calls. Good. They are given counseling right away and talked with right away of, hey, you know, what you went through was kind of kind of a bad deal, and they just automatically know that they go through counseling. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how uh, a creative mind like hers creates a campaign that tries to help people in several different situations. Anyway, uh, I, think that's, I think that's very uh, honorable, and it's not just a self-serving uh, thing where you're trying to make money off of it, although that would be nice someday to someday. to be supported by your, your art, yeah. but uh, until that day happens, yeah. though, it's nice being able to see, like the things that happen with the film festival, you know, 
I actually had some, it's a mission for me. I had yes. some, I had a lady, um, because I was working full time, um, and she said, I don't understand why you would take $5,000 of your own money and start a film festival mm -hmm. for other people. When I took $5,000 and went to the mission field and fed children and did vacation Bible school, and I've been in the mission field. I've been to the Philippines and Peru, and my husband got to go to Central America. And huh, when you see Americans, you see your brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. your fellow humanity in your own country that need a hand up but not a hand out. It makes it easy, and it turned into my mission field. And how I responded to her is you were able to go and do a good deed for one week with these children that really do appreciate you coming there temporarily for a moment. Yes. But for us, we're committed <coughs> to these me. people <coughs> for a lifetime, and we want to teach them how to fish. We want them to yes. have the skill set to create films. And for I jobs. believe the film festival uh, brings to light and brings to the foreground some of those films that were created around the world yeah. uh, that can touch people where they are wherever they are, and it's, it's something that they can be proud of and, and, and know that, uh, of course, most of the, the films that you uh, feature in the film festival are uh, faith-based, mm -hmm. correct, uh, or family-friendly, mm -hmm. and so they can be shown anywhere, and uh, they can, art in film, uh, music, and so forth, can touch people in a way that just talking to them won't. Yeah. You know. One of my favorite ones from the film festival. She's almost nine. Her name is Anastasia Shinkarenko. Um, she did two animations. Her mom helped I remember her. trying to pronounce that name doing the voiceover <laughs> for the uh, things. Yeah. yeah. She just, she was so cute. And we got, um, Gayla Pruitt got to interview her. And we don't speak Ukrainian. She's from the Ukraine. Yeah. We don't speak Ukrainian and we don't speak Russian. So we had a friend of mine that I worked with at Yakov Shmirnov Theater, mm -hmm. um, Andre, um, interpreted for oh, us. Oh, okay, cool. And um, we asked her if she ever got to come to America, what would she want to do? And instantly she just beamed. She's like, I want to see the dragon that breathes the fire that burns the grass. And we're like, where is there a dragon? <laughs> right? And so I was like, oh, Disney or Universal. So they asked, oh. she's like, no, Narnia. Oh. <laughs> so here this little girl in the Ukraine thinks she Narnia thinks... exists. Oh. So that's... we were able to find um, Scooters, which is just down the street from where we held it, yeah. has Agnes and Scooter the dragon uh -huh. at the miniature golf set. And they oh. have this little stuffed animal there. <laughs> this is what's so fun. This is, this is my world. So Anastasia did told us that. I go to Scott, and I and we buy some stuffed animals. Because what eight-year-old girl doesn't like stuffed animals? <laughs> yeah. And then at the film festival, because even though her films didn't win, and her stories were all about being good and being kind, um, we um, wanted to let her know good job. So we put good job in Ukraine, and then the film festival logo on the other side. And since she can't read English, we just asked everybody to sign the card for her. Yeah. And we're going to be mailing that out to her just to continually encourage her. Nice. And maybe one day she will be able to not go to Narnia, but Branson, <laughs> where Agnes and Scooter at yeah. are at. And um, long story short, Agnes and Scooter will probably be working with Steve McAllister in oh, a puppet okay. capacity at okay. some point. Um, when I told Kevin I wanted to reach one million of the 52 million, and with a message of hope, he was totally on board with linking arms with us on that project, which is the wristband project, okay. you know? And so, you guys, if you want to link arms with us, uh, just go to studio222films.com and just click on not too far from here or contact and just shoot us a message and say, hey, I want to link arms with you. And we'll get you connected with our representative because we have ambassadors and in the States and that's... I got too much going on. I couldn't tell you because <laughs> yeah. I have somebody else managing that for okay. me. Okay. So. All right. Good. Well, it was great talking to you, and I appreciate you coming up from uh, the Branson area. Thank uh, you. Yes. And, and thanks you. for teaching me about the extra queens. <laughs>